Natural gas is one of the most utilized sources of energy in America. But natural gas isn't simply taken from the ground and piped throughout the country. It must be processed and rid of the impurities that are produced with it. If these impurities are not first removed, major problems can occur later on when the gas is injected into transmission pipelines. Of these impurities, water is one of the most damaging. And a process called glycol dehydration is used to remove this water from the natural gas. This section will help you better understand the role and basic function of glycol dehydration. This is the first section of a two-section module dealing with the principles of glycol dehydration. Most unprocessed natural gas contains water, either in free or vapor form. Now, the presence of water in natural gas causes two major problems in transmission, corrosion and hydrate formation. Corrosion causes pitting and damage in pipelines, while hydrates deposit on the pipeline interior and restrict the flow of gas through the pipeline. As you can see, water in natural gas is a serious problem. So the removal of that water is very important. Now the process of removing water from a substance is called dehydration. Although there are several methods for removing water from gas, the most commonly used dehydration method utilizes a substance known as triethylene glycol, or TEG, or simply glycol. In either case, all three refer to the same substance. Now glycol is a very expensive chemical. So after it's used to remove the water from the natural gas, we recycle it to remove the water from it and then use it over again and again. Just as a sponge soaks up water, glycol is used to absorb water from natural gas. When gas containing water and glycol are mixed together, the water is absorbed by the glycol, thereby removing it from the natural gas. Now, this process is referred to as absorption. As mentioned earlier, glycol is expensive. Thus, once the water from natural gas is absorbed by the glycol, Another process, known as distillation, is used to separate the water from the glycol, enabling us to use the glycol again. Now, in distillation, water is separated and removed from the glycol by boiling. Glycol doesn't begin to boil until it reaches approximately 400 degrees Fahrenheit. Water, on the other hand, boils at 212 degrees Fahrenheit. So distillation of water from glycol involves heating the glycol water mixture to a temperature somewhere between 212 degrees Fahrenheit and 400 degrees Fahrenheit, allowing the water to separate out as vapor, leaving glycol. In physics, conduction is the process by which heat travels through a substance. If two containers of water, one containing cold water, the other hot water, are placed together, the temperature of the hot water will fall faster than if it were not in contact with the cold water. In glycol dehydration, we use the same theory of conduction. By bringing together cool and hot glycol in heat exchangers, the process of heat transfer through conduction is accomplished, allowing us to control the temperature of the dehydration process. In glycol dehydration, it's important to maintain fluid temperatures within relatively narrow ranges to optimize the efficiency of the process. Without adequate temperature control, problems such as foaming of the glycol may occur. Now we've seen there are two basic purposes to a glycol dehydration facility. The primary purpose is to dry natural gas before putting it in the pipeline. The secondary purpose is to remove the water from the glycol so that it can be used over and over again in the dehydration process. Now the process, while it may seem somewhat complicated, is actually quite simple. Wet gas, that is natural gas with water in it, has water removed from it in a dehydration process. Now in dehydration, glycol literally soaks up the water, leaving dry gas. The wet glycol then goes through a process of distillation where the water is removed by boiling. In this manner, glycol is recycled to function again in the dehydration of gas. In this section, you've gotten a basic orientation to the overall need for dehydration of natural gas as well as the basic principles of absorption, distillation, and heat transfer. Take a moment now to study your student manual. Review this portion of the tape again if necessary, and then continue by filling in the blanks and labeling the diagrams in section one.
Now the next section of this module on glycol dehydration covers the process flow and components of a typical glycol dehydration facility. In the first section, you learn the basic principles and process flow of glycol dehydration. Now in this section, we will discuss in greater detail the major components of a glycol dehydration facility, as well as the basic flow of gas and glycol throughout the glycol dehydration process. This is the second section of a two-section module dealing with the principles of glycol dehydration. A typical glycol dehydration system is shown here, and it consists of the following components a contactor column, and a reboiler, which are the two primary components of the system, an inlet separator, a glycol filter, pump, a surge tank, a gas condensate glycol separator, and heat exchange mechanisms. Now that you've seen each of the parts of a complete glycol dehydration system, let's start at the beginning of the glycol dehydration process and explain that process and how each of the system parts functions. The process of glycol dehydration begins here, when unprocessed natural gas from a well enters this device called a separator, or scrubber. Here, free water is removed from the gas, leaving only gas with water vapor to flow into the contactor column. After passing through the separator, the gas enters the contactor column at an inlet near the bottom and moves upward. At the same time, the dry glycol enters the contactor tower at an inlet near the top and flows across the top tray. Inside the contactor column, there are several trays which hold glycol for the gas to bubble through. Each tray has a number of evenly spaced openings called bubble caps. The gas, traveling upward in the contactor, is forced to pass through these caps and bubble up through the glycol. As the gas passes through the glycol, the exchange of water vapor from gas to glycol takes place. Thus, as it passes upward through each succeeding tray, the gas becomes drier. Before leaving the contactor, the dry gas passes through a mist extractor to remove any glycol in vapor form that may be trying to leave with the gas. As the glycol particles collect and become heavier in the mist extractor, they'll drop back into the top tray and rejoin the glycol stream. The dry gas then leaves the contactor and passes through a heat exchanger where it cools the dry glycol entering the top of the contactor column. The dry gas then enters a pipeline to be transmitted for sale or storage. Now that's essentially the function glycol serves in the processing of natural gas. But as we mentioned earlier, glycol is an expensive chemical and to keep costs down, it too must be processed so that it may be used over again. Now let's look at this part of glycol dehydration. Once inside the contactor, a level of glycol is maintained in the trays by means of a dam called a weir. Now this level is above the slots in the bubble caps, so the gas is forced to bubble from under the caps up through the glycol. As the glycol level builds, it flows over the weir through a slot known as a downcomer and into the tray below. The downcomer seals the glycol passage into the tray below to prevent gas from bypassing the bubble caps. As the glycol spills downward through each succeeding tray, it becomes wetter with the water it has absorbed from the gas and collects in the bottom of the contactor saturated with water. This wet glycol then flows out of the contactor and through a filter where any solid and abrasive particles or tarry hydrocarbons are removed before it enters a pump. From the pump, the cool, wet glycol is sent to the surge tank. The surge tank is a holding tank which stores hot, dry glycol produced by the reboiler before it's sent to the contactor column. However, the cool, wet glycol does not actually enter the surge tank. Instead, it flows through the surge tank in coils. Now, this allows for the heat exchange process to occur, which we mentioned in the first section. As the cool, wet glycol flows through the coils of the surge tank, it's warmed slightly before it enters the gas condensate glycol separator. Conversely, the hot, dry glycol stored in the surge tank is cooled before it enters the contactor column. After leaving the coils in the surge tank, the wet glycol enters the gas condensate glycol separator, 
Now the purpose of this vessel is to remove the gas and condensate hydrocarbons that were accumulated by the glycol on its path through the contactor. Heat will cause the hydrocarbons to separate from the wet glycol solution. Now this hydrocarbon condensate is skimmed off the glycol and disposed of, and any remaining gas vapors will exit at the top. From the gas condensate glycol separator, the wet glycol then flows in a tube through the reboiler where it's heated slightly before it enters the still column. Inside the reboiler still column is a section packed with ceramic or stainless steel saddles. The glycol spreads uniformly over these saddles and drips down through the packed section. The distillation or cooking process is started in this section to boil the water out as a vapor from the glycol. From this packed column, the wet glycol drops into the bottom of the reboiler. Here a source of heat is circulated through a tube in the lower section of the reboiler to heat the glycol solution up to around 370 to 400 degrees Fahrenheit, which is just below the boiling and decomposition point of triethylene glycol. Usually waste heat from compressor or generator exhaust gases can be used as a heat source, but many installations also use a gas-fired heater. Remember, the temperature of the glycol in the reboiler is critical and is controlled at this point. Any higher and the glycol will begin to decompose, requiring costly replacement. As the glycol begins to heat, the water trapped by it begins to boil and moves upward through the still column as steam. Mixed with the steam will also be some hot glycol vapors. As this mixture passes upward through the still column, it comes in contact with a cooler part of the column and the glycol vapors will condense and drop back into the reboiler. The water leaves the top of the still column as steam. As this process continues, glycol in the reboiler accumulates above the heating tube until it eventually reaches the level of an overflow tube. The dried, purified glycol then spills into the overflow tube and into the surge tank once again. From the surge tank, the dry glycol will flow to the pump and then to the contactor column. The pump raises the pressure of the glycol sufficiently to enter the contactor column. The dry, pressurized glycol then passes through a heat exchanger before entering the contactor. Now this final process cools the glycol to near the temperature of the natural gas before the glycol enters the contactor. Now these final steps are necessary to prevent foaming by bringing the glycol to the temperature and pressure of the gas. With the return of the glycol to the contactor column, the dehydration cycle is completed and another cycle begins. This also completes our section in module dealing with glycol dehydration. In this section, you've seen a typical glycol dehydration facility, its primary components, and the basic flow of gas and glycol throughout the glycol dehydration process. In this module on the principles of glycol dehydration, you've learned of the overall need for dehydration and have seen the basic principles behind absorption, distillation, and heat transfers. You've also learned the basic components of a glycol dehydration facility and how they operate to remove water from gas and water from glycol. And finally, you've seen the basic flow of gas and glycol throughout the glycol dehydration process. Take a moment now to review section two in your manual. If you have any further questions, don't hesitate to ask your instructor. He's there to help you. It's important to remember that unlike what many people might believe, natural gas isn't simply taken from the ground and piped to the average American home. It requires a good deal of processing, processing that is necessary if that gas is to help meet the energy needs of the country. Glycol dehydration is an important part of that process, and for it to work efficiently, the entire process must be monitored and operated safely, and that depends on you.